Well, hello everybody. Um, so we tried to do this on Zoom and it didn't work. And then we tried to do it live on YouTube and it also didn't work. Um, we just don't seem to have the blessings of the internet gods. So um, so this is pre-recorded and uh, yeah, we're just gonna do it this way from now on, I think, um, until we can get better internet, hopefully. So let's get right into it. I'm gonna start my presentation here. So today we are going to be talking about the basics of emotional intelligence. Uh, part two is today's presentation. If you have not watched the previous presentations, um, the introduction to emotional intelligence, as well as uh, part one of the basics, um, I would suggest go back and watch those too, because they kind of uh, um, build on each other and uh, they're also going to be, these first three parts especially, are going to be a prerequisite for everything we're going to talk about in the future. So if you have not watched all three of the first um, three parts, go ahead and, and watch those. But today we're going to talk about the 4F survival strategies. And the topics today uh, specifically are the whys of the survival strat strategies. So why do we even have the four F strategies? Uh, what is their function and why is, why is it even important to understand those? And also um, we're gonna go into detail into every, every one of those strategies. So they're called fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. So we're going to look at those in detail and the different personality types and how they might express themselves in, in different personalities. And we're also going to be talking about uh, the recovery. Um, how do we recover from overusing one or two of those uh, uh, survival strategies and how to balance those out. And then in the end, as usual, I have my invitation to you guys, which is basically my fancy way of giving you homework, <laughs> my fancy invitation, uh, my fancy word of giving you um, homework. So I'm trying to put a positive spin on that. Um, all right. So before I even get into it, I just want to mention this. Uh, I so today's most of today's information is going to come from this book. Uh, it's called Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Uh, this book was recommended to me by my good friend Christy, and it's been fantastic. I haven't finished reading it yet, but it had a lot of the essentials of what I actually wanted to present today in it. So a lot of the information today is going to be straight out from that book. And then I just um, added a few of my own thoughts and uh, and impressions to it. So uh, just so you guys know, so a complex PTSD, a CPTS, CP. TSD short. It's uh, it's a learned set of responses, uh, a failure to complete numerous important developmental tasks, which basically lead to emotional immaturity, and they are. It is a, a actually a more severe form of PTSD because it involves emotional flashbacks, something that the author of this book specifically uh, calls toxic shame, because. Regular shame is actually um, somewhat healthy in a way, but um, I'm not going to focus on that too much today. But so it, it involves, involves uh, emotional flashbacks, toxic, toxic shame, self abandonment, vicious inner critic, uh, social anxiety, and it's often resulting from repeated emotional abuse and or neglect. So this is the focus of that book. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be within that framework. But uh, I just wanted I just want you guys to know that this is also um, it doesn't necessarily have to come from your childhood experiences. But in most cases, most of the time, uh, these Oh, the overuse of any of those four survival strategies is a result from our childhood upbringing, from um, you know certain things that our parents, how they have brought up, brought us up, especially if they have been abusive, and that might or might not have been intentional. But um, you know, just so you guys know. So let's get into it. The four survival strategies, like I mentioned, they're called fight, flight freeze and fawn. 
Um, of course, they're pretty obvious when we look at animals, right? Especially the first two, like fight. It's pretty obvious, you know, when you see animals fighting, even, you know, humans fighting, obviously. But when we're talking about human, like especially pathologic human behavior for fight, uh, we're going to be talking about when a person suddenly responds aggressively to something threatening or something that they perceive as threatening. Remember, if you've watched the first two uh, sessions we did on emotional intelligence, uh, we talked about how the brain does not differentiate between real danger or a real threat or perceived threat, okay? So, so keep that in mind. Uh, flight is also pretty self-explanatory. You know, you just wanna get the hell out of there. Um, and as far as human behavior, it is when a person responds to a threat by fleeing or symbolically by launching into hyperactivity. So, you know, they constantly do, 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 do in order to try to basically run away from, from whatever they perceive as danger. Um, as far as the freeze response, um, when, so when animals, you actually, you probably have seen that, um, there's some videos online, you can look it up <laughs> if you haven't seen it, but for example, like antelopes, you know, when they run away from a lion and the lion catches it, they, they, um, appear like, you know, they can get into a, a state of where they appear to be dead and it's not really even a playing dead. It's like their, their body, it's their body responds as if it was dead. They're actually, their, their muscles, uh, completely seize up. Um, and they can't move anymore. And then when you see them wake out of it, you actually see the whole body going through like convulsions and, uh, and um, like almost cramping or something like that. And then they wake up and they shake it off and they run away like nothing ever happened. So that's like the animal, you know, version of, um, also an appropriate version of the freeze response. And actually one thing I didn't know before doing this presentation, which I learned is that possums, apparently do that too. So they basically go into freeze response. So they, you know, they appear to be dead in order to hopefully, you know, they, you know, that's the purpose of it for their attacker to just leave him alone. Um, again, uh, to, when we talk about human behavior, it's when a person realizing resistance is futile, gives up, numbs out into disso dissociation and or collapses as, as if accepting the inevitability of being hurt. All right. And then the last one is the fawn response. And you can see that really well with dogs, for example. Um, you know, when they, um, especially if you have a timid dog and he goes and meets other dogs, you know, sometimes they will cower, cower down and um, their tail starts wagging, like especially the tip of the tail and they kind of round their whole body and they go into a very submissive uh, body stance. And then a lot of times they either flop over onto their back and expose their belly or they lick ferociously, <laughs> lick the other dog's mouth. So that's like an animal response as far as fawning goes. For human behavior, we're going to be talking about when a person responds to threat by trying to be pleasing or helpful in order to appease or forestall an attacker. Again, this is a, a, this applies to an actual physical threat or a perceived threat. Um, and when we're talking about survival strategies, where are we? We are in, if you remember from our previous presentations, we are in our animal nature, all right? So this, um, again, like I mentioned in a previous presentation, this, this, these responses aren't necessarily inherently bad. They just, they're, they're actually automated, pre-programmed gifts of mother nature to mitigate danger, um, especially as children. Because when we were children, um, I talked about this, I think it was in the, um, I think it was in the first presentation, especially when we were children, we were pretty much helpless. And that's why we have those, that's, that's why Mother Nature gave us these gifts to protect ourselves if it's necessary, if we can't rely on the protection from our uh, parents or, you know, any adult that is caring for us. So, um, so yeah, so just keep that in mind. It's not inherently bad, but there is 
Um, we can get into overusing one of these strategies when it comes to being, um, you know, our upbringing and, and abuse and neglect, especially emotional, but we'll get a little bit more into that today. So let's take a closer look of what happens in the moment of danger, right? So you, um, something catches you off guard, something um, is threatening to you. What happens within you, with your psyche, is that your unconscious instantly takes a snapshot of whatever the situation is that you're in. And that snapshot includes anything that your unconscious deems, um, deems important when it comes to the situation, anything, anything important to remember of what that situation is like. So that can be your surroundings, like your house or, you know, you're out in nature somewhere, you're in a park, whatever it is. It could be certain people that you're with. It could be the season of the year. It could be the temperature. It could be a certain smell. It could be certain words that are being used. It could be a certain type of food, certain type of sounds. Anything that, also anything that would, that led up to that uh, specific situation, all right? So your con unconscious takes a snapshot of that. And that, all of that information gets stored in your memory bank, if you want to call it that, which is your unconscious mind, which will act as an alarm system for the future, all right? So this also, by the way, this, I didn't put that on the slide, but this also includes your body, actually your... Um, it's been my experience from, you know, I've, 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 I come, my background is actually in body work. So, um, I've done over a decade of really, really, um, intense deep tissue body work on people, um, amongst other things, but, and, and it's been my experience with myself and with other people that actually a lot of your emotions and, and impressions and, um, trauma gets stored right like literally in your tissues in your body and you can release release those emotions and trauma through your body as well i'm actually going to do a whole presentation just on that i um i actually taught a workshop in hawaii uh, on fascia release and that was one of the main focuses of that workshop is how to release stored emotions that haven't been processed through working with your body so we're going to be talking about that in the future but just i just wanted to mention it here so and then so then all of this gets stored in your unconscious mind and then your body reacts so your brain evaluates which of the four strategies fight flight freeze or fawn has the highest probability of success so whichever will take you out of danger the, the quickest and most efficiently <laughs> And ideally, we actually want to have access to all four F's equally. So that's, that's really the goal because we don't, we don't want to get rid of them because they're useful for us, right? It's our, it's our survival, but we don't want to overuse one or we don't want to misuse any of them just from a you know, psychological response where there might not even be any threat. I'll get into that. So, and then your psyche and your body remember the snapshot that your unconscious took for the future. So especially if you have any unprocessed, um, you know, any unprocessed shocking experience, or if it's like a repeated exposure to, to a similar negative situation, um, which would, you know, be a trauma, then that means the alarm system goes off. So you you actually become hypersensitive to those things that your unconscious stored. So whether that's certain people, you know, again, a certain smell, sound, food, words, whatever it is, you become hypersensitive to it because your body is remembering it. It's like, oh my God, you know, here's the same thing again. When last time, you know, this, this, whatever. Um, you know, last time the sound was present, something really dangerous happened, happened to me. So then your alarm system goes off and you go into reaction. So you can have actually the same reaction as you did when you were in, when you had that traumatic experience, even though you might not even have a traumatic experience. It's just one or more of the things that your unconscious stored are being triggered. And then your body immediately goes into reaction. All right. This, by the way, 
if for anybody out there who's into German new medicine, this is also how they explain um, allergies, for example. Um, but that's another topic. I just wanted to mention it here for anybody who wants to maybe look into that a little more. <laughs> so, so then um, when we have, when we carry a certain trauma with, with us, right, and we, it's, it hasn't been processed, whether that's uh, something, you know, that happened in, in our childhood or, you know, like I said before, it can happen at any time in your life. A lot of times, a lot of our issues come from our childhood. But then we tend to overuse one or two of the strategies of the fight, flight, freeze or fawn. Um, and that's because our body remembers, oh, last time we did this, it got us out of trouble. So let's just do that again. And then it's just, you know, if you, if, especially if it's a repeating, a, a, a repeating trauma, you will constantly go, get back into the same reaction because that's what your body knows and that's what your body was successful in before. So your body is actually, you know, making, trying to make things easier for you <laughs> and, um, you know, trying to find the best, the best solution and, and is using what has worked really well in the past. So, so then we develop a primary mode or a combination. So, you know, a lot, of, and that also depends a lot on our personality. Like I said, what worked for us during past trauma or neglect, neglect is actually a type of trauma as well. Um, you know, general life experiences, so we go into overuse of one of these uh, survival strategies. And there are certain, uh, certain types too that have a combination, like you could be a fight, uh, fight fawn person, personality or a flight fight or whatever. But I'm not gonna go into the hybrids uh, at all today. I just wanted to mention it, but usually we have one primary one that we that we default to that's our preferred survival strategy so when we do overuse one of these strategies it actually impairs our the appropriate access to all four f's remember i said ideally we want to have access equal access to all four f's but if we tend to overuse one then obviously we don't have access to to the other ones because we're just so used to getting into that one that worked for us in the past and we also, it's really hard for us to relax, um, which means that our sympathetic nervous system is constantly active. So um, if, and if that's the case, if some of the signs that your sympathetic nervous system is constantly active is, especially if you have like chronic issues going on, like adrenal fatigue, I actually, I personally think that adrenal fatigue is actually the healing phase of of um, a sympathetic nervous response so it's actually the the healing of it but but we can go in and out of healing as well again you german new medicine people out there you know what i'm talking about then um so yeah adrenal fatigue could be one hypertension uh tight muscles tight fascia high blood pressure high uh, high blood sugar could be a sign as well and you know of course there's a million other ones um but that's just just for you to think about um for me too coming from body work it's been really obvious to me when somebody is you know is is caught in one of those four survival strategies and they're constantly stressed like the nervous system is constantly uh, in hyperdrive you can actually feel that on their body like there a lot of times i will i would have clients that <clears throat> are their their tissues are just really really dense you can't even really feel the individual muscles and it's just like they they're basically wearing an armor and which is really interesting so um yeah so that's something to keep in mind <coughs> excuse me also what happens when we overuse one of those um strategies is that our perception gets skewed remember in the first session that i did i talked about that specifically um which means that our perception does not correspond to reality and i talked about why that's important so you might want to go back and check that out 
And also we tend to overreact by going into survival mode. And uh, that, that can also lead to alienation because, you know, of course, if we're overreacting, other people are not necessarily going to be able to understand what's going on and why we're overreacting. And that drives people away. And a lot of times this, you know, this can be re-traumatizing because one of our, well, two of our most basic needs as human beings are connection to another person or other people and uh, safety. So when we drive people away, obviously our need for connection gets disconnected. So that leads to alienation and that can be re-traumatizing because a lot of these um, the pathological use of those survival strategies are uh, actually a way for us to try to find connection and overcome a, you know, a feeling of abandonment that we might have experienced during childhood in, in different ways. So, so that can be one of the reasons why we use one of those um, survival strategies because we don't want to be abandoned. And uh, yeah, so... That's why if it leads to alienation, drives people away, it can be re-traumatizing because we're, we're actually getting the exact opposite of what we want. And, and also, um, you know, going back to the perception gets skewed and doesn't correspond to reality, if we don't really, you know, especially if we perceive something that is not really a threat, but we perceive it as a threat, then... Obviously, our perception doesn't correspond to reality, but then things like, for example, if you're a fight type, right, things like a, like a defense mechanism can actually become an offense because you're, then you're getting into fight mode when there's not, not any threat and other people are not going, going to understand why you're fighting them right now. So it's actually like you're attacking them and that's why it's important. So let's get into detail <laughs> about the four, four types. So the first one we're going to start with is the fight type. This is also called the narcissistic defense. All right. So their modus operandi is, called, uh, is control to connect and rage to feel safe. So remember I said connection and safety are, are some of our basic human needs. And so the fight type wants to control in order to connect and, want, and rages to feel safe. So power and control to them actually equals safety. Um, the, so every, every type has a appropriate you know, application as well as healthy expressions as well as negative expressions. So we're going to look at all of those. The appropriate application of the fight defense would be aggressive self-protection when it's necessary. All right, that's pretty self-explanatory. Healthy expressions of the fight type are healthy assertiveness, good boundaries, courage, and leadership. All right, the negative expressions, and keep in mind, these are basically, um, what I want to say, like um, ex uh, extremes, right? We're talking about extremes here. So keep in mind that there is all sorts of shades and, and uh, there, there's a spectrum of all of this. So it might, um, it might not express itself as in an extreme way as I'm showing here, the, you know, as I'm showing the negative expressions here. So there might be a, a more subtle expression of it, but it's still a negative expression, all right? So just keep that in mind for all of the types that we're gonna be looking at. So negative expressions for the fight type are narcissistic, explosive, controlling, even up to enslaving. Uh, entitlement, they're the typical type A personality. Uh, they're impatient, they can be bullies, they're demanding. They're actually demanding love. <laughs> um, they can be sociopaths. Uh, and this book that I mentioned, um, again, it's called Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Uh, he talks about, uh, he also mentions some common disorders that 
that um, th they can portray. And with the fight type, it's uh, the common disorder would be called a conduct disorder, which is characterized by aggression, destruction, deceitfulness, and violation of rules. Right here, some more, some more characteristics of the fight type. Um, so they tend to alienate others with angry and controlling demands for love. So they actually demand demand their love. Love me now. You have to love me. <laughs> All right. Um, they respond to feelings of abandonment with anger. So when they get abandoned or when they feel like they're getting abandoned, they get angry. They project perfect, perfectionistic demands onto others. Um, that means, so basically the way to think about that is that they have some perfection, perfectionistic uh, idea of how they are supposed to be. And that usually also comes from our upbringing, from, you know, the demands that our parents um, maybe put on us or, you know, how they how they expected us to be their their version of perfect, basically. And we internalize that. That's that's what uh, is meant by the vicious inner critic, too, because we internalize these demands from mostly our parents, but it doesn't have to be our parents. Like for me, for example, I actually have a lot of issues from school, <laughs> from my teachers and just from going through the school system in Germany. But uh, yeah, a lot of times it comes from our parents. So we internalize those perfect, their version of perfect of us. But for the fight type, instead of realizing that they think they have to be a certain way in order to be perfect. They actually, they don't even realize that they project it out onto other people and put their ideas of what it means to be perfect onto other people. And then when they don't get fulfilled, they rage. They get angry. They also tend to use contempt to intimidate and shame others. And they use others as an audience for incessant monologuing and dumping grounds for their anger. And this is actually kind of an emotional release for them, which can even be addictive. So they can get addicted to using another person. A lot of times it's the fawn types, which we'll get to, um, for their, for their uh, raging and for the, re the release of their anger. And this is the last point here. That's a really um, interesting quote I found in, in the book. And he says, children who are spoiled and given insufficient limits, which is a uniquely painful type of abandonment, can become fight types. Why is giving insufficient limits, so <laughs> rules, boundaries, and limitations, like Caesar Milan would say, um, why is that a uniquely painful type of abandonment that's really interesting to think about um i think that's my personal opinion is because you basically if you're not giving your children rules and 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 limits then you're you're taking away their ability for empathy and how to connect with other people and how to relate to other people so you're basically taking away their <coughs> excuse me their sense of or their place in the world. And it violates the golden rule, really. So that's why it's, for me, I mean, that's that's how I see it. All right, so, sorry, I have something stuck in my throat. <coughs> so how do we, how do we recover from the overuse of the fight mode? Well, first of all, you have to, <coughs> ah, excuse me. First of all, you have to really look at yourself honestly and see where you lie on the spectrum between healthy assertiveness and bullying, right? Really um, try to objectively assess yourself. And you can actually, I, I thought about this doing this presentation, <laughs> depending on depending on how how deep you want to get into this or how um, how much effort you want to put into this. But I thought maybe it would be a good idea to give out <clears throat> um, if you really want to know what other people think about you and when where what what their sense is of where you lie on this spectrum. 
is to give out like a, you know, questionnaires, like a, uh, anonymous questionnaires for people to fill out and then have them, have them give it back to you <clears throat> anonymously. And then you can kind of see where you are with, with, with all of that. But that's just an idea. <laughs> I haven't done that personally, but um, it's just really interesting because a lot of times, you know, we how other people perceive us is completely different of how we think they perceive us or how we perceive ourselves. So that could actually be a really interesting, interesting experiment. Um, <clears throat> so, but basically for the first thing for the fight type for recovery um, and get, and how to get back into balance would be to become aware that their aggressive behavior scares other people away. And it actually perpetuates the feeling of you know, being alone or being abandoned or whatever their issue is with that. So, um, so just becoming aware of that, that, that that's actually the exact opposite of what they're trying to do. That's the first step. Remember, first step is always awareness. Also, the next one is probably, I, I want to say probably one of the most important ones for them. It's taking time outs and removing yourself from the triggering situation. So when you feel like you're getting really angry and you can't control yourself, remove yourself from, a, from that situation. You know, just leave. And just a little hint here, you can communicate that as well you can you could say something like you know I'm feeling really angry right now and I, I don't want to say anything I'm going to regret so I'm going to leave now and I'm going to come back when I'm calm when I've calmed down that will actually probably increase the trust that other people have in you because it shows when you when you are able to communicate communicate that it actually shows that you have yourself under control and that you know what to do in order to not hurt the other person all right, so that can be actually really, really important. So, you know, try it, <laughs> try it out. I know, I know it's really, really difficult to do when you get triggered to, to come to that, to where you're, you're able to do something like that, but it would be immensely helpful. Also redirecting your rage. Um, and this is a common theme that you'll see throughout this presentation redirecting certain emotions towards your childhood circumstances or maybe even towards some people in your childhood like a lot of times it would be your parents and i'm not saying like go and scream at your parents unless you know that might might also be necessary if you if they've really been abusive and you just need to get it out that's fine but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's just it's basically um <clears throat> imagining yourself back when you were a child and redirecting the rage and anger that you have towards that situation and how helpless you were and how how you've been abused instead of instead of projecting all that anger out into your surroundings th that you're in right now that have nothing really to do with that situation or that you know it's not the fault of your surroundings right now it's it's whatever you went through in childhood so redirecting those emotions to those times in your life and those circumstances you know being aware that that there is a difference there and also finding positive outlets i mentioned before for fight types especially um you know things like martial arts something physical something where they you know get a punching bag or something um to get that out of your body as well and then you can also channel it into creativity like you know whatever if you're a music musician you know writing songs or painting or whatever you want to do right like a lot of a lot of the really really great art pieces whether that's paintings poems you know songs actually come from negative emotions so <clears throat> So yeah, so that's one way. Also, connecting with sadness to release the pressure. And that can involve tears too, right? Whether that's crying by yourself or crying, you know, with somebody else, just get it out. And this is another quote from this book that I found. Um, and he says, when, when we are hurt, part of us is sad and part of us is mad. And no amount of angering can ever metabolize our sadness. 
So anger always comes with sadness and fight types tend to only connect to the anger part and not the sad part. But you can't anger the sadness out of you. <laughs> you, have to, you have to give sadness its space as well. So just connecting with that feeling and actually letting it come through you and processing it that way and releasing it that way, that can really help with anger issues as well. Also learning the empathy response of the fawn types, which I will get to later. So just keep that in mind. But basically a, a big part of this is putting yourself into the shoes of another person. So how, does, how, would, how would you feel if somebody screamed at you in anger? How would you feel if somebody, you know, dumped all of their emotions on you and, and used you as an emotional release? How would that make you feel? How do you, how do you think the other person feels when you do that to them? Um, you know, just connecting with that. Also, mind, the mindfulness about the needs, rights, and feelings of, of other people. And um, let me see. I have some notes here. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um... Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Mindfulness about the needs, rights, f and feelings of other people because they tend to be narcissistic. To, so they tend to not even think about what the other person needs at that moment or, you know, what, what they might feel. They just, they, they're just in their own space venting, basically. But connecting with that, like, hey, what about the other person? And then um, learning to recognize signs that you're being too forceful by the reactions of others. I put that, I, I added that to, to the recovery plan here. The, one of the best mirrors for you are, can be animals. I, I can tell you for myself and I'm not, I'm not a fight type. Um, that's actually my last <laughs> response that I would go to, but I learned the most about myself through my dogs. Dogs especially are such a great mirror. They're, they're the perfect mirror for whatever is going on with you because they will, they will react to your energy and it's never personal. When a dog moves away from you, it's never a personal thing. They're just reacting to your energy. So watching how your dogs act around you or how other how animals in general act around you it's such a great way to really self-reflect but you can do that with people too you can you know watch other people and see see if they're moving away from you are they tense and stiff when you touch them right if if you touch them do they like shudder do they kind of like twitch do they just get tense and really stiff like they're petrified or, um, or do they seek your closeness and can they relax around you? You know, does an animal, for example, does your dog come and sit on your lap and just, you know, snoozes off and falls asleep? That means you're in a good state. So when those things happen, when people or animals relax around you and when they come close to you, pay attention to how you're feeling inside. And that's what you want to connect with, especially and that's what you want to remember, especially in, in situations where you get triggered. And I know that's really, really hard to do, but it's, you know, you have to start somewhere and you have to start practicing these things. All right. So, um, for example, my dog, I used to have a dog, uh, Tiki, she's passed on now, but she was abused. Um, she was a rescue dog and I adopted her. And before I got her, she was abused and she would... Oh my God, <laughs> I learned so much about myself through her because she would not come near me if I was angry or frustrated, even to the slightest bit. She would just, she would run away from me. And sometimes, you know, she would just take off and I would get so angry because she just takes off and runs into traffic and gets in all, all, ki all kinds of trouble. <laughs> and I'm trying to get her back. And she realizes I'm frustrated and she would she she would just stay far enough away from me so I couldn't grab her. And every time I tried to grab her, if I wasn't in the right mindset, if I wasn't in the right emotional state, she would take off again. So I really, really, really learned to control my anger that way and really just calm myself down so that my dog will come to me and not get run over by a car. That's what I mean. Like dogs, I can only recommend everybody should have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my professional opinion no I'm just kidding 
but you get the point. All right, let's move on. Flight type. They're also called the obsessive compulsive defense. Uh, remember, all of these are actual defense mechanisms, right? But sometimes they're inappropriately applied. So their thing is perfect to connect and perfect to be safe. So everything for them has to be perfect. They have to be perfect. Everything they do have, has to be perfect in order to try to connect with another person and to feel safe. They, the, uh, the appropriate application for this defense mechanism would be re to retreat if a confrontation would exacerbate the danger. All right. So if you can't, if you can't fight, you know, your opponent or whatever, whatever it is that is threatening you, you retreat. That, that would be the appropriate application. Uh, the healthy, healthy expressions of this type are healthy disengagement, industriousness, know-how, and perseverance. And the negative expressions are, they can be obsessive-compulsive, panicky, constantly rushing, worrying. They basically try to outrun their pain. They're doing, 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 running, 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 always staying busy because they don't want to deal with their pain. They're running away from their pain. They can be adrenaline junkies, busyholics, they can micromanage, and they are compelled by perfectionism. And some of the common disorders could be bipolar or uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. <clears throat> some more characteristics. So they're perpetually busy and industrious to avoid inner pain, like I just mentioned. They're obsessively and compulsively driven by the belief that perfection will make them worthy of love. All right. And this, you know, again, like a lot of times, you know, parents, you know, if you, oh, if you come home with an A from your quiz, then, you know, you're a good girl or you're a good boy. Right. So, so that can create like something, something simple. It doesn't have to be like actual, like full on abuse or anything, but something simple like that can, um, you know, can bring something like that into motion. Um, I have a friend too, and her, I mean, multiple friends actually have told me about this, but basically their parents always, you know, told them, or one, you know, one part of their parents always told them like, no matter what they do, it was never good enough, right? They're never good enough. They always had to be better. They could always, they, they would always just show them how to improve things. They would never get a, oh, you know, you did that really well or good job or anything. It was always just like not good enough. That's the type of, you know, that can create an overuse of the flight type because then you're just constantly into this perfection mode to please your parents and get that attention and, and connection that you're seeking with your parents. And, you know, if, if especially if they punish you for not having good grades or anything like that, um, that, that would basically tell you or make you feel like you're not safe when you're not being perfect in that sense, right? Um, when they're not doing something, they're worrying or they're planning about doing something. So worrying is a really, really... Um, big characteristic of these people too. It's also, it's a left brain dissociation, which means that they're basically not using their right brain a lot, especially when they, you know, when they're triggered, they're all left brain. So they're constantly um, thinking to distract from underlying abandonment pain. And some, some of the flight types might also recklessly and regularly pursue risky and dangerous activities because they can be adrenaline junkies because they're constantly rushing, rushing, rushing. And when they ever slow down, their adrenaline goes down and they can't handle it. So they just go right back into something that will spike that adrenaline so they can get their, their addiction, <laughs> their rush again. So the recovery for the flight types, um, again, find out, you know, really honestly assess yourself where you are on the scale of efficiency and just plain drivenness. <coughs> One of the main things that flight types would benefit from would be to move into their feelings. 
because they're constantly running away from their feelings. So if you just slow down and stop and actually feel what's underneath all of your busyness, that would be a first step, especially the emotion of grief. And again, here, you know, a lot of times it's about our childhood. So, so directing that grief towards the losses you had in childhood, um, you know, that would be a, a good, a, a positive way of how to use that negative emotion and, and release it. Learn to slow down and relax into neutral. <laughs> and that's really difficult to do for flight types, obviously. I actually, I know somebody and she told me, um, and she's, she's, I mean, she's this type to the T. And she told me she hates to relax. Like she won't get massages. She hates lavender. <laughs> Anything that will make her relax. And she's not aware of any of this at all, by the way. Like she has no self-reflection when it comes to that. But it's just something that she mentioned to me. Like she, she hates relaxing. She's like a little puppy dog. You know, she just goes, 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 goes all day. And then she just crashes and she falls asleep. And as soon as she wakes up, she goes, 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 goes again. It's really crazy to watch. Um, so take time to reprioritize because a lot of times those flight types, they can be really scattered and kind of run around like a chicken with their heads cut off. <laughs> um, so, so taking time to take a step back, slow down and reprioritize again. You can do that with short three minute or whatever meditations, you know, several times a day. You can just sit down for three minutes. I mean, three minutes is not a lot of time, although for a flight type, that seems like an eternity if they have to meditate. But <laughs> um, it's one of the really, really good techniques for them because they then they will make themselves slow down a few times during the day and actually take time to center and reprioritize again and, and um, you know, get back get back on path on, on their path basically some of the questions that you can ask yourself during those three minute, minute meditations first of all of course you just sit down close your eyes breathe slow down your breathing and then um you know tell your muscles to relax you know just take a minute or two to just do that just tell your body to relax and then some of the questions that you can ask yourself on how you can actually be more um efficient again in your life is for example like what is my most important priority right now and what is the most beneficial thing I can do next right really think about it because flight types don't really think about these things a lot they just they just launch into activity and don't really think about what they're doing too much um also if you want to get deeper into you know into your feeling world really you can ask yourself what hurt am I running from right now because that's that's a very common thing right you're busy 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 constantly staying active because you're running away from something so what is that something like really try to connect with that and if you don't get an answer right away don't worry about it just keep asking that question maybe something will come up and use the outside world as a mirror. I'm really a fan of, of doing that. <laughs> Using the outside world as a mirror um, for different things. In this case, to let, you, to let you know when you're being too hectic or too busy. Um, that can express itself as like maybe clumsiness or if you're uncoordinated, like if you're dropping things all the time. You know, that's a sign of being too hectic and too busy and you're not really thinking, you're not being mindful of what you're doing right now. Um, also, do you often misplace things? You know, do you put things somewhere and you don't remember where you put them? Um, that's a very common sign for those types too. And also, you know, going back to the animals, do animals get excited around you? That's not necessarily a good thing. I know we, you know, we think about, you know, we think about it as so cute, you know, when, when we come home and our dog gets really excited and they jump up on us or, you know, whatever, or you just get up, you know, walk around the house and your dog just gets really excited. But in the animal world, that's actually not necessarily a positive thing because you want to be calm. <laughs> you want your animals, especially your animals, to be calm. So if animals usually respond to you by being excited, that's a, that's a pretty good clue. Also, do others always rely on you 
to get things done or fix their, you know, quote, emergencies or whatever it is? You know, do, do people always rely on you for that? Because, you know, you've proven to be so driven and motivated and busy to do things and fix things. So, um, you know, a lot of times people will just be like, oh, okay, well, she likes to do that or he likes to do that, whatever. So, so yeah. Moving on, the freeze type, also called the disso dissociative defense. They won't connect. They just won't connect. And they hide to be safe. The appropriate, uh, appropriate application of this defense is to surrender when resistance or further activity is futile, futile or counterproductive. And the healthy expressions of this type are acute awareness, mindfulness, poised readiness, peace, and presence. <clears throat> Negative expressions are, they can be very codependent, hiding, camouflaging, they isolate, they can be couch potatoes, they can suffer from depression, they're actually very prone to depression, they can be spaced out, they can be hermits, they're achievement phobic, uh, they can be domestic violence victims. Why? Because, you know, remember I, I talked about the fight type, right? They, they will just release their anger. And the freeze type will just disso dissociate from, from whatever is happening. So they won't let it come close to them. So they, they'll just let it happen. You know, like the dog, right? They just flop over on their back and, and show their belly. And um, no, that's actually the font type, sorry. But <laughs> the associative type, they just they just completely space out. They they disconnect from whatever is happening right now. Uh, so they can so they can be they're often used by narcissistic types to um, release their pressure. Uh, a very common um, uh, disorder, sorry, <laughs> a very common disorder is uh, attention deficit disorder, ADD. And they can also have schizoid-like tendencies to dissociate. Some more character characteristics of them are they're deep, uh, they have a deep unconscious belief that people equal danger. And that's why they try to, they, they just hide. That's their, that's their safety net. They spook easily in intimate relationships. So if anything like rattles their cage, they're out of there. <coughs> um, it's, a, it's a right brain dissociation. Remember the flight type? We talked about left brain dissociation. This is a right brain dissociation. So basically they're, they're completely um, or almost completely leaving the left brain behind. <laughs> And they're completely on the right side of their brain. So they're, they disconnect from experiencing abandonment pain. And this disconnection also protects them from risky, quote unquote, social interactions. <clears throat> and they also have those internalized uh, perfectionist, perfectionistic demands, but they project them out onto other people. But in, instead of the like the flight types, uh, the fight types do it when they rage. If those demands aren't fulfilled, the freeze type uses the imperfections or what they see as imperfections in other people as a justification for isolation. So they're saying like, okay, you're not you're not perfect or safe enough for me. So I need to I need to get away from you basically, and they do that with pretty much. A lot of people, <laughs> almost everybody. Um, and they are a master at the art of changing an internal channel when their inner experience becomes uncomfortable. That's the schizoid tendency. So if they feel something uncomfortable come up, some uncomfortable feeling, they completely dissociate and distract with something else. They um, also this and this is this was really and I actually learned a lot from um, doing this presentation about myself because this is this is my uh, my primary type this is my primary defense type so uh, fantasize about dying and this is also a quote from the book it's it's about an internal opioid release and and this author of this book he he says like he thinks that 
Freeze types may be able to self-medicate by releasing the internal opioids that the animal brain is programmed to release when danger is so great that death seems imminent. Um, that's quite a heavy thing to, uh, you know, to, to realize. But for me, as a primary freeze type, I can, I can confirm this. This is actually what I, I had going on a lot in my like teens and and twenties and and all of that. I, that's exactly what what happened to me. Like I fantasized about <laughs> dying, getting into accidents, anything like that. Because and I didn't realize that until I I read this book and then, until I did this presentation that it, it was actually an opioid release. It really was almost like addictive. Um, and it's also a, you know it's a defense mechanism because you're. Um, you are trying to protect yourself from from that possibly happening in the future. I'll talk I'll talk a little bit more about that in a in a future pres presentation also. But um, yeah, so that's that's a pretty common thing with freeze types, and they also can have addictive tendencies to self medicating substances, um, whether that's pot or um, opioids or you know any anything like that. And they tend to also need a higher fix, you know, higher and higher fix of those if if they have those addictive tendencies. I, I luckily, I'm not one of those people. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so whenever you know, whenever they, um, whenever they get into uh, substance abuse they get the kick out of it and then they need more of it because they need they need more to dissociate because they kind of get used to used to that so so yeah that's been really interesting to to learn this in this book um the recovery for the freeze types assess yourself where you are on the scale between peacefulness and complete catatonia so you know complete inactivity and the freeze types, um, gradual trust building is really what, what would help them recover. And that's, that's actually really hard to do on your own. So in this book, this guy, uh, Pete Walker, the author, he really recommends that or says that freeze types usually can really benefit from therapy because then they have a, a therapy because they're so isolated too because they don't know a lot of people or they don't they don't want to connect with a lot of people so they really can benefit from having a therapist walking them through the trust building of it i i haven't um i haven't taken advantage of that yet but yeah so and then also connecting with grief again directing it towards your childhood losses and uh, um, he also says in this book that um, especially fight types are usually pretty unlikely to um, really admit to themselves that, that they have any issues. You know, we're talking about fight types now. So because because then, you know, if, if they would admit to themselves that they have anger issues or that they might not be in the right or whatever, they would have to show weakness and that's not what a fight type wants to do because that that challenges their their feeling of safety because then they'll they'll they won't have any control and for freeze types he also says that they're very likely or unlikely to even know that that anything is going on because a lot of times they actually really enjoy their isolation which i can attest to myself and and they don't really they don't really see a problem with it um, and they don't really know that they're that they're that there's something brewing in the unconscious because they're just they just dissociate. It's not like their um, behavior, I guess, is not as obvious um, to the outside world anyway. But yeah, getting in touch with anger through grieving. Remember, with the fight type, it was actually getting in touch with sadness through anger. Here for the freeze type, it's getting in touch with your anger through sadness and grieving. So expressing anger towards your childhood experiences and abusers. Um, and then uh, learn to recognize the signs that you're disengaging 
and learn how to assert yourself and, and come back to being present. And some of the signs that you might be disengaging if, if you know, or that you're a freeze type if you don't even know, are do you engage in prolonged bouts of sleep, daydreaming, wishing for different things, uh, TV watching, video games, online browsing, any any kind of any kind of activity that kind of um, dissociates, you know, that just takes you out of your th that kind of puts you on autopilot and just passive passiveness, really. Um, also, are you suffering from depression? Again, freeze types are really prone to depression. Not that the other types can't experience depression, but freeze types especially. Also, do you have an intense, do you have intense social anxiety? All, actually, all of these defense types can experience social anxiety, but for freeze types, it's usually very intense. And, you know, do you feel numb a lot? Like, do you not even know what you're feeling sometimes? So those are some good hints for you to watch out for. And last but not least, the fawn type, and which is also called the codependent defense. And they merge to connect and grovel to be safe. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't know. And they, the appropriate expression for the fawn type would be to help and compromise in a non-groveling manner to show understanding and disarm dangerous situations before they escalate. Right? So you you're appeasing the other person or you're, whatever is endangering you to disarm the situation and not have it escalate. Healthy expressions are love, service, compromise, listening, fairness, and peacemaking. And negative ex expressions of the font type are, sub they can be subservient, groveling, loss of self they actually just completely give up themselves people pleasers over listening like they're constantly just listening to other people they're never or hardly ever really uh, expressing themselves they're just listening they're just there for the other person they just abandon themselves uh, they also can't make decisions <clears throat> a lot of times they don't even know what they want uh, they can be a doormat even up to like almost like being a slave and uh, one of the mo uh, one of the common expressions uh, negative expressions would also be uh, social perfectionism so they have to um, you know they're worried about what other people will think of them and they they need to know that other people have a good image of them and they can also be a parentified child meaning they're basically a parent to their parents so also they seek safety by merging with the wishes and needs and demands of others so again they completely abandon their own needs and wishes and just completely give themselves up to whatever the other person wants they seek safety by becoming helpful and compliant, a compliant servant. So they just try to um, be overly helpful, always uh, offering themselves up and always comply with whatever, whatever it is that the other person wants. They can also be um, almost like pushy when it comes to offering their help, right? Uh, some in this book, he also talks about that some especially children, um, develop a tendency to be entertaining in, in a way to be pleasing to another person. So, you know, they, they become an entertainer and, you know, make other people laugh and, and do all of that, that kind of stuff. They often have at least one narcissistic parent. So they, they often become a victim to, uh, narcissists so they often they're often drawn to or exploited by narcissistic types and they learn their behavior from a narcissistic parent and because you know what i talked about before the fight type the narcissistic type right they will basically um put their demands on other people and 
basically overrun them and the font type will just let it happen. And they, they learn as children that that's the safest thing to do, right? So I actually want you guys, sorry, this is, um, I'm gonna um, go on a little, a little different diatribe here, but I actually really would like you guys to look at these things, even the negative expressions of these types, not as something like, oh my God, you know, I'm so bad, I totally do this. And, um, you know, something negative in that sense, because it's, it is a response that at some point in your life has been helpful for you and or was helpful for you and got you out of trouble and maybe even saved your life. So it's just that, you know, somewhere along the way, <laughs> um, things have gotten a little out of whack and now it's time to, you know, be aware of that and come back into balance. So... All right, getting, getting, getting back to the font type here, the last point, um, they're also the most developmentally arrested in their healthy sense of self because a lot of times as children, they were shamed and scared out of developing a sense of self. They, they, they weren't allowed to be or have their own needs and be themselves. So they were shamed and, and punished for that. So they never actually developed a sense of self. So that's why I'm saying like a lot of times they don't even know what they want. And so th that's why they can't make decisions. The recovery for the fawn types, um, assessing yourself on the scale of where you are between helpfulness and servitude. Like how helpful are you really or are you just being a servant to somebody? Sh uh, shrinking the characteristic listening defense. So constantly getting into listening mode for somebody else, trying to trying to shrink that a little bit and not be not always be in the listening position, practicing saying no. And that can be very challenging for font types. It, it actually can scare them. Just just thinking about saying no to somebody is make, usually makes font types really uncomfortable. And it feels like something that they might never be able to do. And also practicing making decisions. So, you know, really getting in touch with, with what it is that you want. And also practicing your and broadening your verbal and emotional self-expression. And this goes back to the emotional literacy. I, I mentioned that in my last presentation. I actually also have a document for you if you're interested. I put together a, a, a table basically of different um, words and how to express your emotions because there's so many nuances to our emotions and feelings that we have. So just having a, a broader spectrum of how to express ourselves with that verbally, um, that, that would be really helpful for font types. And also nonviolent communication, which is which is something that I want to cover as well in a previous presentation. I want to dedicate a whole presentation just on nonviolent communication. It's been super helpful for me. I'm actually a, a freeze fawn combination type, <laughs> so so I I have dealt a lot um, with a lot of these things for myself. So nonviolent communication has been one of the one of the huge things that has been really helpful to me so and feel free to look it up um there's actually uh, there's a bunch of books you can get and stuff but like i said i'm going to cover it in the future so stay tuned and then learn to recognize signs that you are fawning and get in touch with your own desires and needs so um the some of these signs that you are fawning could be are you parenting your parent? And, you know, we're not talking about, like, of course, you know, if you have an elderly parent who needs, you know, who might not be mentally stable anymore, you know, that's a different situation. I'm just saying, like, in a regular situation, do you have a parent that's actually more like a child to you? Or you're basically fulfilling the parent position for them? Are you always listening to other people? You know, like we said. Uh, do others unload their problems, emotions, and anger onto you? That's a very big clue that you're a fawn type. Do you often um, not even know what you want? Uh, does saying no scare you? Are you worried about the image that other people have of you? 
you know, what what do other people think of you? Does that is that something that's constantly on your mind or that you're worrying about a lot? And also another thing is, um, do you constantly apologize? Font types will apologize for every little thing. The author of this book, <laughs> it's actually funny. He gives an example. He's he says he's a a font type, I guess. And he said he caught himself one time when he stumped his foot on a chair and then he apologized to the chair. <laughs> that's that's how how extreme it can get sometimes, but you know, that's that's a typical fawn response. And of course, you know, do you do you put your needs and desires last more often than not? So that concludes the four um survival strategies. I hope you learned something. I do have some general recovery guidelines to kind of go go for all of them or, you know, just gives you a general idea, um, maybe to get oriented a little bit better. So basically, the way you want to look at that is the, you know, they balance each other out. So um, for the fight type, the fight types want to actually um, look at the positive, uh, you know, the healthy expressions of the fawn types and try to integrate that more. And the same for the fawn types, they want to look at the healthy expressions of the fight types and try to see if they can, or how they can integrate those better into their lives. And the same for the flight and freeze. The flight types want to look at the healthy expressions of the freeze types, and the freeze types want to look at the healthy expressions of the, uh, the flight types. Um, and, I think, oh, I think I forgot to mention for the freeze types too. I think that was on the slide, but I forgot to mention it. One of the big things for the freeze types is also to move to, you know, any kind of aerobic ex aerobic exercise <laughs> where they have to move their body, which is a positive expression of a flight type, right? This movement. Um, that's what uh, another thing that they can balance themselves out. Sorry, I forgot to mention that, but I just thought of it when I saw the the fight, uh, freeze, flight, opposition there. And then um, another uh, another few points here: admitting trauma and def the defense style to yourself. Obviously, right? That's you have again. We're at the awareness level here. You have to be able to admit that to yourself at least to in order to work on it shrinking the inner critic so those perfectionistic demands that you have internalized probably from your childhood those um those will express themselves as as a, a lot of times as an inner critic and a vicious inner critic at that so that's the little voice that you hear you know like oh my god you're so stupid oh my god how did you why did you do this wrong again you suck you're so bad at this you know all those negative things like a negative self-talk that is most likely from some kind of perfect perfectionistic demand that you have internalized from your childhood i um i know jen i think it was in the first session that I did on emotional intelligence, the other Jen, Jen Jenny G. <laughs> uh, she mentioned that she would be really interested in a presentation on negative self-talk. So I'm going to do that really soon. I think maybe not the next one, but the one after that. I'm probably going to talk about that. So we're going to talk about the inner critic there specifically. And then um, again, you know, th that was a, a certain or a common theme throughout this whole presentation is redirecting certain emotions, especially emotions like anger and grief, because they're so intense and they're so base, they're such basic emotions, towards uh, the painful childhood experiences. So not, not, ex not projecting that outward into your current world that has nothing to do with it, but taking it back to its roots and where the unfairness actually happened because you want to uproot that right and then finding positive outlets for that too like i mentioned uh, that could be physical activity a certain physical activity or inactivity for the flight types or you know anything that that's creative um and then also allowing self-compassion which does not mean wallowing in self-pity that's not the same thing you're actually allowing self-compassion so, so you have to allow you actually have to first of all 
um, understand that you're worthy of compassion and then and then being able to or allowing yourself to give that to yourself and one way you can do that is i'm sure most of you have heard about this but the inner child work right so you're you're thinking of you're thinking of yourself as your child like you can even imagine your yourself in front of you as a child in that situation that was very traumatizing and painful for you and then what would you do if that was actually a, another child that you know you just met or that you know or whatever you know family member what would you do if you found that child in that situation that you experienced you would comfort it right you would give it compassion and and um you know doing that for the child so think about that for yourself because that's you right so that's one way to think about think about these things all right so <laughs> this is almost the end here now the last thing that i want to give to you on your way until the next presentation or the rest of your life is my invitation to you and that today is about radical self-honesty and that is so hard to do sometimes right especially with this kind of work because you have to admit to yourself some really painful things maybe and also admit to yourself that you might potentially be hurting another person with your behavior and that's that's a really really difficult thing to come to terms with and and admit that to yourself but it's so important and don't think about it. I mentioned that before, but don't think about it as fault finding. It's it's about finding a place within yourself where you can um where you are creating damaging ripples in your life basically and where you are engaging in in a separating manner with life because the goal is right to find to find that center and find that balance and not create more damage in the world but in order to and sorry my dog is coughing up stuff back here but in order to get there and to do that to um be able to stop that process is to you have to admit it to you have to first be able to see it and 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 admit to yourself that that's what you're doing right because in the end it's all about self-realization and and uniting right integrating these things and come back to unity and and you know finding god basically and one of the tricks i want to give give to you <laughs> in this presentation that i often apply when it comes to being self you know being honest with myself about how i behave is that i remind myself that i don't necessarily have to tell anyone else about my realizations and this might seem really silly but it's been really helpful to me so so when something is really hard to admit to yourself just remind yourself like okay you don't have you don't actually have to tell anybody else it'll be your own little secret between you and you <laughs> and well and god because he sees everything but um, but he's actually you know he's gonna like what you're doing because it's actually gonna bring you back to him so um so yeah just you know be aware of that and remind yourself you don't have to tell anybody about any of these things the most important thing is how you see yourself and how um, how you're using the information to create a better better life for yourself and for the people around you. All right, and this is the end of my presentation, part two of the basics of emotional intelligence. If you are not aware, I'm sure you are because you're watching this on YouTube and this is our channel, but just in case you're a random person that just stopped by, we have a church, my husband and I run a church, it's called the Gnostic Church and Academy of Lord Jesus Christ. We fo focus on the mystical aspects of Christianity. My husband does sermons every Sunday at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time on our channel here online. And everything that we provide is for free. Um, if you want to donate uh, and support us in our work and see more of this material and keep us going 
we have a Venmo account, we have a Buy Me a Coffee, we're on Cash App. You can become a, subs a Subscribe Star member, and all the links should be in the description of this video. Um, if you need, if you want to send us care packages or cards or letters or any cash donations or whatever it is, you can email that. Here's our, uh, I'm sorry, you can mail that to, here's our mailing address. This is my, this is my, uh, my legal name is Jennifer Dietz. So you actually have to mail it to that name or make, if you write a check, make it out to that last name. And here's our mailing address for now. We are in the process of moving, so this is going to change. But for now, this is where you can send things. And if you have any questions, ideas or comments, whatever you want to um, tell me, here's my email address, jen at gnosticacademy.org. Feel free to email me and let's have a chat. And that's pretty much it. So thank you so much i'm gonna try and see if i can come back on camera here hello <laughs> so thank you so much for um joining me and watching this video i'm sorry we couldn't do it live but that's just the situation that we're in right now and i hope you enjoyed it and you learned something and yeah we'll i'll see i'll see you next time <laughs>